turn to the book of Revelation, please. Chapter 12. Uh, our word this morning. So Lord, we give you thanks and praise that we never grow tired of the message of Christmas, the wonder of Christmas. Thank you, even Silent Night was sung by so many throughout the nation on Christmas Eve. This carol song, Lord, that filled with hope, filled with light and love. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you promised that heaven and earth might pass away. But your word would never pass away. We see it coming to fulfillment each and every day, Lord. And during these dark times, we thank you, Lord, that we can share your light, your love, and your hope for the world. Amen. Amen. I thought we'd share today from the book of Revelation an historical review of the birth of Christ coming into the world. We know the book of Revelation is filled with symbolism, of course, but there's so many riches in there, in forests which to discover for ourselves. And so if we read from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 on, John, in the vision given him by the Holy Spirit on the Lord's day, He says, he saw a great and a wondrous sign that appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And at that time, another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Well, many would like to take a lot of the book of Revelation, literally. But you could never do that, of course. You'd find yourself in all kinds of trouble. But this chapter here, if you like, you can take some of these verses literally, because it happened literally. Mm-hmm. But John here wants to see it symbolically, which will give us a richer view about the promise of God made even in the Garden of Eden, chapter 3 of Genesis. And that promise was carried throughout all the generations up to the eventual fulfillment of it 2,000 years ago with the birth of Christ. This wondrous sign that appeared in heaven, this woman, Clover the Sun, was not a woman, but it was the nation of Israel itself. The nation of Israel that carried this promise that one day God would bring the Messiah, the Savior, into the world. The woman represents the nation of Israel. God would be the husband of the wife, Israel. And that relationship would be a permanent, was meant to be a a faithful, honourable relationship that was often broken by the woman, Israel itself, when they turned their back on God Almighty and went their own way. But God's promise of sending the Messiah would not fail He would bring forth the saviour of the world through this woman. And that woman was only a specific woman. It was symbolic. It's the nation of Israel, no other nation. The nation of Israel alone was chosen by God. A little insignificant nation. If you go back to the time of Abraham there. This is a a small nation, but one that God had chosen. God had ordained 
that he would carry his message throughout all generations to the whole world. It's not that God had just loved the nation of Israel, but he loved the whole world and chose this nation in which he would send his message out even to us Gentiles so that we would be blessed by this message through this woman. God Almighty had set apart the Jewish nation for himself and so that his promises concerning the Messiah, the Jews and the Gentiles also would then get to hear this message, this promise and see its fulfilment by believing God's message. If we look at John chapter 1 just for a moment, verses 9 to 13, which connects us lovely to the coming of Christ the first time. Verses 9 onwards. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And he came. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to those who were his own people. But his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who receive him, to all who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Children now born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God himself. So this Jewish Messiah coming through the nation of Israel would be not only for the Jews, but to everyone who believes in him. Everyone who receives him as God's promised Messiah, the saviour of the world. Romans chapter 9, Paul helps to expound on that theme there. In Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 6, concerning the coming of the Messiah and the promise to the world as a whole. Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs, the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. These are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all and forever to be praised. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all are descended from Israel, are Israel, but all who believe. And trust in Jesus are the true Israel today in the sight of the living God, isn't it? Amen. The promises were made to Israel and through Israel, but also to all Gentiles who also believe and trust in Jesus as the Messiah. Amen. So when we sing Christmas carols here in the West and all around the world, we can sing that with great confidence and assurance that we are accepted by God mm. because we accepted him who came to his own but his own received him not but to us who received him we are now called children of the living God and no one can mm. take that away from us mm. though our ancestry does not go back to Abraham physically yet spiritually in the eyes of God we are the seed of Abraham now through Christ Jesus our Lord and Saviour Praise be to the Lord God that the promise given through Israel and to Israel has extended to the ends of the earth even today 
and it's for everyone who believes and receives in that. There's no one else to come, you know. The promise has been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. This woman, this nation Israel has delivered. She was pregnant for thousands of years waiting for the promise to be fulfilled for the Messiah come to deliver them and to make them right with God. And, and when he came, they recognized him not. But thanks be to God, we are standing here today because of that promise was fulfilled. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit has made us born again from above into the kingdom of God through Jesus the Messiah. So from that time, way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 there, up until the fulfillment of the birth of Christ, isn't it? Verse 2 says, she was pregnant. God's promise was being worked out through the nations, through individuals and families and generations, to the exact time God knew that the Messiah would come from heaven to fulfill the mission that God was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. And to set us free and to reunite us with our Creator, our God, which we could not do by our works or by faith alone, but by the sacrifice and finished work of Jesus alone, of course, for us. Israel, we know, had to suffer much by the calling of God to be His chosen people. Mm -hmm. The devil is always after them. Yeah. always trying to destroy them to lead them astray and so forth but God in his grace and mercy and his long suffering and tolerance of them he put up with them because he would fulfill his promise through that nation alone his promise cannot break and be broken or fail and he says the woman she was about to give birth no generation at that time or before that time could be sure exactly when the Messiah would come. But he would come one day. She was about to give birth. They're wondering, will it be in our time? Will it be one of my daughters? The Israelite men might be saying, for which the Messiah might be born into the world. Surely, however, the Messiah was coming. That's God's promise. But the exact time... No one could be sure. That was God's promise. But no one could know exact time then. And it's the same today. Christ's coming again. Amen. We cannot know the exact moment when he's going to peel open the heavens and come in great power and glory Amen. to his own who are waiting for him. But he is coming. Amen. Just as he promised the first time, and it took thousands of years there, it was fulfilled by Almighty God. So we have great confidence that Christ will come again. Is every possibility he'll come in our time, in our generation, by the fulfillment of scripture. Mm -hmm. He has to come in, at one time to fulfill all the scripture. And it's all rolling out lovely before our eyes today in great excitement mm -hmm. and joy for us who might be alive to see the coming of the Lord mm -hmm. and for us to be caught up to meet him in the air. But in the meantime, we have a job to do. Continue to proclaim his name to the people living in the shadow of darkness and the fear of death out there. We must say the Messiah has come. He's fulfilled God's purpose in offering himself as a sacrifice for sins of the world. There's no more to be done now. To believe and to receive and to rejoice in the future that is ahead for us. Thanks be to God for fulfilling his promises. Mm -hmm. The birth came eventually. Not only did Israel know of the promise, but the spiritual world also knew of this promise because we know Satan was there in the garden. At that time, when God made a promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent eventually, yeah. he knew of it. And so throughout the generations of history past, Satan was waiting and watching the nation of Israel to see when that Messiah would come. The dragon we know here in Revelation chapter 8 is the devil. It's that ferocious creature out there to destroy the souls of men through deception, through persecution, by whatever means he can. 
There, we know then this dragon Satan is the leader of those rebellion fallen angels. They knew of the promises concerning the coming of the Messiah for Israel and for the world. The promise of the coming of the Messiah means hope. It meant hope. For Satan it meant big trouble. For he knew he would undo the works of the devil when the Messiah comes. Mm -hmm. He would open up people's hearts and minds to the truth of God and his mission and purpose of God is to save the world by his grace and his mercy that we didn't deserve. Mm. We know that Satan kept a close watch on the nation of Israel, waiting for the sign of the Messiah that he would eventually appear. The devil may have eventually known the exact Jewish virgin child that would give birth to the Messiah. He may have actually seen the angel of the Lord come in to give the promise to this virgin child that through her the Messiah would be born. But he could not stop it. He could not no, he could not interfere in a sense with God's purpose of bringing the Messiah in the world. He might try to frustrate it but no one has a greater authority or power, or purpose, an almighty God. No devil, no arm, no, no one, no nothing can thwart God's plans and purpose. That's why I have so much confidence of eternal life to come. Because our names are written in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord, isn't it? Nothing, no devil, no death, no disease, no nothing can thwart God's plans that he has for us in the future. Thanks be to God. Satan, he could not harm this little virgin woman known as Mary, for God was watching over her, wasn't he? He was watching over her like he watches over us as well. God may be watching the wicked, but he's watching over the righteous, isn't he? The only other option Satan had was to try and destroy the Christ child himself the moment he was born. And we know from Matthew's Gospel there, and look there, that Satan would use an earthly king to try and destroy the Messiah. King Herod? Am I right? Yeah, King Herod himself. We know he, he feared that another king or, or or a Messiah coming into this world would mean trouble for his throne and his position in Israel. Mm. And Satan worked on that so that he would use him to try and destroy the Christ child the moment he was born so God's plan of salvation for the world would be trashed. What a foolish thought for the devil to try and think he could outwit God, mm. outdo God Almighty himself. Mm. Just then, as God uses men to fulfill his purposes, so Satan you tried to use a wicked king ever to fulfill his purpose in killing the Christ child and thus destroying God's plan of salvation for the world. If that came to pass, what hope would we have if the Messiah was destroyed and sent away? It would be an awful kind of situation to be in, is it? We would then have to say, might as well go along with Solomon saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And then we could never be reconciled to God the Father. Mm. But thanks be to God Amen. that if we read on a little favour, it says this, yeah. the dragon stood in front of the woman. He was watching the nation of Israel carefully. He knew that the Messiah was coming, who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. He tried, but he failed. Thanks be to God. And she gave birth to a son. We know his name is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. There was many false messiahs who came after Jesus. They went into insignificant history. But Jesus, his word, his kingdom, the gates of hell couldn't prevail against it. It has marched forth around the world for 2,000 years. To show he really is who he claimed to be. And if the world said, well, we don't believe that anymore, I can't. I could never deny him because it's what he's done in my life. How he's made me born again. I wouldn't be here 
today if Jesus wasn't the Messiah at all. <clears throat> she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Psalm 2, where God warns the, the nations of the world there that embrace the son, kiss the son, because he has himself, God has said, it is my son who's going to rule over this world forever one day. Not no earthly communist ruler, kingdom, or dictator, or whatever, as he planned to be. Psalm 2, you can read that for years later, with God. He speaks about placing his son to be the, the king, the ruler over this world on his second coming. Thanks be to God for that indeed. Yes, he will rule over all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and his throne. And in between those few words there, we have the ministry of Christ for 33 years. And you can read up on that for yourselves in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. In the, the Messiah, he was born and he was snatched up to God and his throne. We know from Acts chapter 1 there, he was taken up to heaven before their sight. And the angels said to the disciples around them, you've got work to do. But this Jesus whom you saw go into heaven, he shall come back in like manner. And we're waiting for that time now, won't we? Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. So, and we see, so what happened to the Christ child after his earthly ministry was completed? He was taken up to heaven where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is waiting for that time now when God the Father will say to the Son, Go fetch your bride. Mm. Go bring her to heaven, the rem remnant that is still on earth. Go bring her home. Yeah. And then it will be the reunion between God the Father, the Son, and His church. And we know during that time, earth history will go on for a while. And in the book of Revelation, here we see where John clearly says that when the church is taken from the world, Satan has his own Messiah, his own saviour, his own answer to the problems of the world. But John names him as the beast of Revelation chapter 13 and so forth. And a lot of the world will turn to that. Those who reject Jesus and Messiah will accept something else, something worse, a deception. And so we give thanks to Almighty God today that even though the nation of Israel rejected the Messiah when he came, God hasn't given up on the nation of Israel. God has not given up on this world either. There is still time for individuals in the nation of Israel to read the Holy Scriptures and find the Messiah for themselves before his second coming. And so you, John, gives us a small picture of God's promise at the beginning of creation after the fall and God's promise being fulfilled 2,000 years ago and the Messiah in heaven now and reading on from the chapters of Revelation from this Christmas story you'll see in chapter 19 there where the Messiah comes again in great power and in great glory. We need just to go to John, uh, 1 John chapter, chapter 1 this morning. And he gives us a beautiful view of the birth of Christ. 1 John chapter 1. Listen, just don't form Revelation. Not the Gospel of John. 1 John chapter 1. Verses 1 to 4 first. I just want to read you John's own Revelation of his eyewitness account of Jesus, that he saw himself, that he lived with himself, with him during his ministry on the earth. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. 
And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make your joy complete. Mm -hmm. John wants us to have the joy he had. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the privilege that he had in seeing the Messiah, living and working with the Messiah, witnessing the miracles and the teachings of the Messiah, and the miracles he did, and the ultimate sacrifice of the Messiah. He was there at the cross, John, with Jesus' mother Mary. He saw it all. He's recorded it all for us so our joy might be like his joy if be completed knowing that the Messiah has come. Mm. He has completed the work and he is now with the Father in heaven. Mm. Our fellowship now through the ages is with John through his message. And John said his fellowship and our fellowship also is with the Father and with his Son because it comes through faith and trust in the word of God itself, isn't it? We are united throughout the ages by that. Mm. Mm. Chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, or fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, I write this to you so that you may not sin, but because of our fallen nature. But if anyone does sin... We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The tragedy today is the world out there don't realize that their sins have been paid for by the Messiah. And if they accept that, they can rejoice in that like us. It's so sad. I meet men up in Perth Gellin, hard-hearted men, who reject all that Christ has done for them. He loves them. Mm. He's atoned for their sins and has a future for them. And I, I fear that in the lost eternity, then they'll get it. But it'll be too late. Yeah, it'll be too late. Yeah. The land of regret and of no return. Mm -hmm. That's why we must not give up or apologise for offending people by sharing the gospel. It's our duty. And we do it also because we compel by the love of God in us and through us to reach the people out there who are still in, living in darkness, isn't it? Mm. John wants to encourage us in verse 12 of chapter 2 by saying this. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven. On account of his name. Jesus just didn't come so that we can have Christmas dinner and presents and all, you know. He came on a special mission to deal with the sins of the world, which is the most crucial thing. If we're ever going to be right with God and enjoy an eternity with him hereafter. I write to you, fathers in the church, older men, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men. Because you have overcome the evil one by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Don't try and overcome the evil one by your good works or your religion or anything. It'll fail. Many have done that. And they've failed. They leave this world unsure whether God will accept them or not. But we overcome the evil one because we believe in God's word. Not the devil's world or the world's word. Yeah. Not the leader's word. But God's word yeah. is final authority, first yeah. and foremost in all things. Yeah. I see on the telly, they have, yes, rightly so, they thanking and praising the scientists for the vaccine they found now. To, what about the immune system that God created and placed it in man? First and foremost, we wouldn't be here today. If God had not created our bodies fearfully and wonderfully made, first and foremost, and give man the ability to think and to work against the evil that comes against us, let's give God the glory first and foremost yeah. before all that. 
I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. How come? Because the word of God lives in you. And you have overcome the evil one. That's the secret we come in over the evil one. The word of God lives in us. It only changed us, but is active in us. It's, it controls our thoughts and our actions. And it fulfills our hopes for the future as well. It's the word of God is a secret to successful living in this life. And overcoming the evil one. If only Adam and Eve had said, well... Serpent, I know what you're saying to me, but I'll stick to what God tells me, thank you. We wouldn't be in this situation today. We know who's telling the truth in the Garden of Eden. Jesus said, Satan is the father of lies. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. We know who's telling the truth. God said, you take that throat and not you shall die. How many billions of people have died throughout the ministry because they didn't take God's word seriously at the beginning of creation. How many people today don't believe the Christmas message and are still living in darkness and without hope and they're, they're celebrating Christmas just for the sake of it? But we have, a, we have a substance in us when we celebrate Christmas because it comes from the word of God itself. So let us hold fast. Let us then, young men in the church here, let us remain strong because the word of God is living in us. And the evil one then can not touch us. Nearly finished now here. Yeah. And just an encouraging us to continue on in this battle in these days ahead. Yeah. Remember this, no matter what happens in the world, God is love. That's what compelled him to send the Messiah into the world. We didn't deserve it, you know. Israel didn't deserve it. They kept going astray. But God in his love, his grace and mercy is the only reason why we are standing and we gathered here today. Not because of any goodness at all. So many religions of the world today are trying to work their way to God's favour. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. They're only breathing God's air and walking on this earth because of his grace and mercy. Even when man rebelled against him uh, 6,000 years ago, God in his grace and mercy and his love reached out the hand of reconciliation to fallen mankind. We know this is how God has shown his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Mm. His one and only son. There's no one else to come, you know. Only Jesus a second time. Mm. The Jews missed him the first time. And they accepted all kinds of false messiahs after the true messiah went back to heaven. And it cost them dearly. In fact, the city was flattened because of their rejection of the Messiah. What's going to happen to this world where they continue to reject in the Messiah and thinking science is the saviour of this world? Mm-hmm. Messiah will end up being the downfall of this world. It's like putting a gun in the, in the hand of a child. Mm-hmm. Technology of a man without God in control. Yeah, so. Indeed. Let us continue to trust God in his word and his promises. This is love, world. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as a toning sacrifice for our sins. And so, brothers and sisters, we have have seen and testified that the Father has sent his son to be the saviour of the world. We are encouraged. We are grateful for all the science and medical world is trying to do to help problems. But after this problem goes away, it's like an arrow coming in at all. Are we duck and we miss it? We survive this virus? But then what about the spear that follows afterwards? Uh, or, or there's a pit, but they'll jump over it, but you might catch your foot in the snare. There's something coming all the time now in the last days against mm-hmm. mankind. Mm-hmm. And, it's all, and the only thing can save us from it in the end is the Messiah Jesus, mm. our Lord and Saviour. Remember that. I'll say this once more then. Mm. And we have seen and testified, said John, that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. And so now everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Mm. Born of God. Children of God. What a wonderful destiny ahead of him. 
Who is it then who overcomes the world? Only he believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The Muslims are in deep trouble, you know. All the other religions and the non-believers, they're in deep trouble in this world. God has extended his hand of love and reconciliation, but when man pushes it, oh, I'll do it my own way, it'll end in disaster and great sorrow. They say, no, that's a hard, very narrow-minded message. It's Jesus' message. It's God's message. The world might hate us for it. Don't worry, they hated Jesus for it before us. And if we carry his message, don't expect anything different from that. Because the world in its fallen nature is hostile to its creator. And is ever running away from him. And trying to do away with him. But let us continue to be a thorn in the side of the evil one. As we continue fiercely to proclaim the message. The Christmas message that always it overcomes the world. Only he believes that Jesus Christ is the Son who has come from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so I can close by saying, we know that we are children of God, sadly, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Remember that? The whole world is still under control of the evil one. Yeah. But remember in chapter 2 there, John said, you're strong because the word of God lives in you and you've overcome the devil because of the word of God. The word of man and the world must never come before the word of God. Sure. David Attenborough's message concerning how the world came out, it must never come before the word of God. Sure. God is the creator of all things. Amen. Not evolution, not crazy ideas, fairy tale stories for grown-ups and all the rest of it. The devil is very crafty. He, he got his hands into every kind of message to try and dilute the word of God, or pollute the word of God, or take it away. But not so for us. We are standing fast in the truth that is in Jesus. Amen. And so verse 20 of chapter 5, I finish, it says, We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Amen. Amen.